300 to 1,000 each year.
Um, I have the AKT limitations on the CC were a lot more relaxed. So you could basically firewall it if you needed to. Is that not accurate? I know you were warning about watching the ITT. Uh, it's really just a reminder to watch your engine. So right now, I'm not so much concerned about burning up the turbine in this particular jet. Later on, you're going to have uh, you're going to have infrared emission considerations when you're down. Understood. Okay. Uh, Mike, you When you're doing your sorry, when you're doing your level turn, is that the uh, respect to MSL or the ground? Because like when we were doing the turn just now, the ground was kind of rising in the direction of the turn. Yeah, A firm. So your level turns are going to be with respect to the ground. You want to maintain that constant altitude over the ground. to 500 foot block in principle doesn't feel that much different than the 800 to 1000 foot block until the terrain starts to undulate and then things get real interesting. So here, task load is pretty low. 
we get up ahead to the peak of the mountain, and as the mountain kind of moves around underneath us, you'll start to have to really concentrate on what's happening to maintain that altitude block and monitor what's coming up ahead, anticipate what you need to do with the controls of the jet, and anticipate throttle input. to that basin. We're looking for 300 to 500 AGM. Once we're established on 350, 
I have a question about the the valleys, kind of like where it's 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 steep and you know you're gonna break, like perhaps your ceiling. Do you how aggressively do you accommodate for that, or do you just kind of ballpark it to where you only break the ceiling for a couple seconds? All those are tactical considerations and the considerations of your chief. Sometimes you may be in environments that are completely unforgiving of you breaking your s For example, you are sneaking into adversary territory, and if you're detected, now you're screwed. And boy, are there going to be scenarios coming up in DCS Academy that check exactly If you're able to sneak in or the adversary's radar can't detect you, it'll be a far easier mission than if they get a fix on What other questions or comments on that last evolution do you have? Just for your 
awareness, we've dropped off the lot ATC scope, so we all the radars that are out there in the range, we uh, cannot see us anymore. As you begin to see, you get comfortable being this close to the ground. You essentially have stealth without investing all the engineering and materials research into and coding research into stealth aircraft. this small little ridge up to the peak. And man, I was on the uh, stall shaker uh, pulling it back out. Where's that What I saw from my end, so uh, maybe you could kind of use it as a learning thing or, or to troubleshoot it, because I kind of just basically went off instinct. Um, when I saw sort of my closure rate to Twinkie, and then I saw the ridge that we'd have to go over, my brain was like, there's no fucking way I can slow down and make that ridge. So I kind of like blew past him, um, and I barely made it myself. Is that like good, bad? What should I have maybe said something to him? Said something to me? How, how should that have flown? Uh, in terms of formation flying, you should have told him because he's not necessarily looking behind him. So just an advice that you're coming up and you're going to pass uh, from on his left from his seven to his eleven. Got it. Should I reach up and grab you, Twinkie? I guess I he's not on comms. Uh. Yeah, I lost my radio when it crashed. So I don't know yeah. why it said you crashed instead of me, but... I don't know if it's easier, but I took the, the air spawn A, A to A uh, C-101 until I got back so fast. I don't know if that helps or hurts.
So, uh, as you noticed, there's kind of extreme things you have to do with your airplane when you naively pass over a mountain. You also silhouette yourself against the sky, which is prime shooting opportunity for both radar-guided missiles and infrared EOIR-guided missiles. Uh, and, you know, you can't see where your flight lead went because he drops below your nose. You can't see the terrain if you don't have a good idea of what's already on the other side of that mountain. And those extreme uh, performances, uh, performance or uh, inputs you need to put into your plane may cause you to stall or otherwise hit the ground, and then you shouldn't even have taken off that. So, uh, the naive way of doing all that is not very good. And we all learned or experienced to various degrees the hard way why we should not be doing Questions on uh, not coming over ridge tops, the naive. Yeah, I'll, I'll be that guy just because I'm, you know, kind of sitting in on this. So uh, I get the why not, but the, the how is, uh, just can you kind of reiterate that for me? The how for what? For not coming over the ridge top naively. Yeah, we haven't covered that. That's what's coming next. Ah, okay, okay sorry. sorry. Good. Good. Other questions on the naive approach to coming over ridge stops and not screwing yourself up or killing yourself? Uh, just, just sort of an assumption, uh, based on, uh, just kind of some of the things that you've been saying, and some of the things I've seen and doing, is it to sort of be understood that part of really good planning involves, uh, knowing what your airspeed needs to be to kind of accommodate for maybe those valleys we talked about earlier, or something like what just happened where we know, hey, maybe we need to carry a little bit more airspeed than 230 to get over this thing. Yeah, so part of the planning is airspeed, although the airspeed is really part of the planning for timing reason. The other aspect that's in there, and the air-to-ground guys do not belabor it, but they get it as part of the preparation at cadet level 3, is when you load yourself down with bombs, your engine can only develop so much power, which means it can only put so much energy into you when you're climbing. Uh, and so you have to take all of that into account. If you're running up to something and you need to climb in altitude and you're loaded down with a bunch of bombs, you should probably come into that climb with more speed than you would do it if you didn't, if you weren't loaded down with a bunch of bombs. So it's not about getting out uh, maneuverability tables and whatever for the air to ground guys, that is stuff that they will just learn through experience. And for right now, we have identical airplanes and the airplanes aren't loaded down with stuff. There isn't a lot of external drag, which is another factor in that equation, on top of not a lot of external weight. But later on, it gets harder. One more question since we're orbiting. Um, when we do like a, a trail like that, and say it, it's uh, the situation is thus that you have to be close enough, like say maybe a half nautical mile, do you seek to kind of offset from trail just a little bit so you're not eating your weight turbulence, or is that just like a you just don't be that close to somebody ever kind of thing? Yeah, you always need to be managing the wake turbulence of the guy in front of you. So being offset is a good thing. Another option is you're going to be at or above his altitude. That makes, makes sense. sense. Thanks. I was using it a little bit to determine how well I was following you as well. I was starting to pick up a little verbal. I'm like, ah, he's been through here.
blocking correctly? And I was more asking too, just like how, because uh, I kind of saw that developing before I guess you did, and I didn't really have time to talk, I just kind of made sure I didn't die, and that's, that's what I was going over. Yeah, I did. 
Okay, okay keep in mind that gun, gun is not inconsequential. inconsequential. It goes away. Okay, he just shot. I'm extending out to the. You can just shoot all the ammo out, and then it'll make it lighter. I'm not authorized to shoot ammo yet. <laughs> Well, it's got unlimited ammo, too, so you'd be doing that a long time. Yeah, uh, Sula, are you authorized to shoot ammo? I am authorized to shoot ammo. Damn, I thought you just told him yourself. Alright, I'm gonna hook back and do a 180 degree turn. Head back towards that mountain range. Why we lost as you were talking? No visibility problems. Everything was good. Was I the only one that lost half of that thing? No, uh, I need to see if SRS is good at modeling line of sight. Everyone's over the map. 
force clear. Alright, which, uh, which guys get cut up? Uh, I'd say about... <laughs> I, I, I don't know. You, you kind of cut off and then I, I said something like, Hey, if you're transmitting, we can't hear you. And then Twinkie uh, pointed out that it was the line of sight. Yeah, alright, so I turned to the south and I eased my climb so I didn't get a stick shaker, you probably all heard that. Then I uh, found a convenient place to make a 160 degree turn, um, heading back to the north as I crossed over that ridge line. That's probably where I dropped. So as I came over the ridge line, I was going to be careful not to let that, that uh, turn climb away. I can be more aggressive in that turn because I know the ground is going to slide down away from so I can be more comfortable in letting the ground slide away, but critically I can look out the left side of my airplane and see the mountain range as opposed to being blind to it as I make that turn and descend uh, as part of the... Then I also can look to the right and see... Uh, I'm, so what's also happening is I'm able to hide in the radar clutter. It's hard for the sensors to see me. It also gives me an opportunity to pop right back over that mountain if if I get five or six SAM launches suddenly, hey, I can hop back over that mountain, break radar lock, and escape. If everything looks good out to my right, things look good, no one seems to see me, I don't get anything on my radar warning indicator that says I've been spotted or I'm being tracked, I can just turn to the east, descend down that mountain. As I'm descending down that mountain, I can pick up a bunch of speed, help me stay low and fast, and then uh, continue on my mission. And I didn't flash myself to the sky. It's hard to see what my initial navigation vector was, so it's hard to see where I came from or potentially where I'm going. And that's what that's all about. Questions on that evolution? Um, I have one, it's more of a technique question, but I'll set up in case you the other two guys have one if not, I'll go. I'm to turn left here to the north. Alright, so I'll just ask then. Um, going up the mountain, I noticed, uh, to kind of make that turn to the south, like, it was really helpful for me to use a lot of rudder. Um, and it kind of kept me, uh, basically on plane with the, the terrain. And, you know, if that was good or bad, then when I came over the ridge, I basically felt like, a, like a 130 degree, almost rollover, was, was warranted to keep me, again, within that, uh, sort of altitude block. Just, um, a technique check, more like, was that good, bad, or, uh, you know, any, anything you could troubleshoot from that? Um, if you're rolling over that far, you're just essentially blind to all the stuff that you were just blind to. Did you see four SAM launches happen just after you came over the mountain range? So just be careful about that. Other questions about that evolution? Turn back to the mountain range here. All right, since that was so much fun, we're going to try it again just to get everyone a second bite at the air. This run, you get to pick whether you're going to turn to the south or north. Uh, the trick is completing the maneuver, getting back to where you should be, getting acquisition on the guy in front of you, so that you can maintain uh, the flight formation and flight coherence. Watch out for the power lines on the run-up. So again, about 60 or 70 percent of the way up the mountain, you're going to make a turn either to the north or the south. Kind of extend yourself, uh, like doing the switch back on the mountains. So you don't have to be as aggressive with the maneuvers and run out of energy quickly. Then when you're ready and it's convenient, you cut over the mountain. Um, try to stay as low as possible after you come over and give yourself some options to come back over if someone shot at you. At the minimum, you're hiding in the sensor clutter so people can't see you or take a shot at you. If everything looks good, then you resume your course, turn to the west, and try to find the guy who was in front of you and maintain uh, the flight together. Any questions before we get to this ridge? 
เงินEastern side of this ridge now, moving over, getting a little peak. Maybe my radar warning receiver started to go off with search radars. This looks like a good place. I'm going to do about a 160 degree turn to the south. And I'm going to dive back below it so I don't silhouette myself against the sky for two. Heading to the south now. Got some mountains I got to avoid. Checking my radar warning receiver. Did I get locked up? Do I have a missile launch warning? Do I see any IR missile smoke trails? Everything looks good. I'm going to start to roll out to the west and resume my attack. Interesting looking. Yeah, so on the left at about 
after 11 or 10 o'clock, you'll see I've smoked the strafing pit. So we're going to do some low passes there. I'm going to also smoke some bombing targets. They should be blue, Sam. So there's some bombing targets there in blue. So as you move to the north side of this range, you'll be able to see that the strafing pits are really just two side-by-side -side rectangles. So this is the uh, area of operations that will be in for tomorrow's lesson. So we're going to do an orbit up here at about seven to 8,000 feet and just kind of peer down and take a look at these things from the sky. And then we'll come down lower and take a look at them near the ground. range control towers here. And coming up at about our 11 o'clock is one of the bomb target. So you can see there's kind of a white shipping container in the center of that thing. And there are some additional bomb targets to the north. We won't be using those as much. And in the northeastmost corner, there's just a lone tank out there, a uh, nice bomb target without kind of the bullseye around to be more realistic of what you encounter in the field. And I continue my turn to the west. side of the guns and rockets range. The strafe pit. Gonna come around on this other bomb target which is on the west side.
Again, easy enough. Simple white container in the center of bullseye. Smoke is going to help you judge what the wind is like at ground level. And what's the uh, house uh, file line uh, defined? It's just road, or uh, we'll see it here in just a moment. We're going to continue to the south here and then turn to the north, so we're flying right along the Strafe Pit Valley. Oh, I'm going to start my turn to be flying along the Strafe Pit Valley. Questions. One, is there a leaderboard? And two, um, are there, I assume, going to be posted parameters for like what's good, what's bad, what's like within acceptable uh, for, for uh, Dick Shot's hit? I think that is part of the script when you check in with the range. So we'll go over the range check in procedure, which is part of the script. There's some pre recorded human uh, voice files so that you check in with range control um, and then you check in with the range master. So those are two separate frequencies. You can get them in the briefing here. Um, and then uh, as part of that process, it'll say, I think, that you have to get rounds within 80 meters of the bombing target to get scored at all. The closer, the better. Um, you have to get like 100 or 80 sh uh, bullets on target to have it count as a successful strafe without crossing the foul line, things like that. Is that 80 rounds or 80 percent? 80 rounds. Yeah, so given that you got like 140 in the gun, that's like 50 percent, right? Or a little better, 60 percent? Well, you get to load up a 500 cal machine gun, so we'll go over all that here when we get to Korea. The cannon that you have loaded is really for air-to-air -air or tank hunting. Ah, okay, okay. So at this stage, and especially for these 
planes, so flying these planes with DCS Academy, you're not going to be hunting tanks. At best, you'll be doing uh, what's called counterinsurgency operations. So the hard, most hardened you can expect the adversary to be in is a truck. So if you fly up here and you fly kind of to the south, southwest, um, way out there, if you look at kind of our 12 o'clock, you'll see a single red smoke. It's actually a little test I put in a while ago. I haven't taken it out yet of a JTAC who's sitting up in the mountains here, putting continuous laser energy on that target. So that's in preparation for some LGB ranges I still have to build. But the red smoke is a good indicator that you're flying on the correct vector to uh, creature itself. And for rocket attacks, do you use the gun strafing range for that as well? Sorry, cut out there. A firm, yeah, you use the same uh, strafing range for rocket. So the, so the bombs that you'll be dropping here, I mean, we're talking about it tomorrow, but the, Trump, the bombs you'll be dropping, these practice bombs, put white smoke wherever they hit. But the script augments that with colored smoke. So if, for example, you come in and you happen to find a buddy to fly with you, part of the script is you can say, I want my bomb impacts to be orange smoke, he wants his bomb impacts to be green smoke, so we can differentiate between the two.
has a shorter one, one's a much longer one. And since you're a human pilot, you can pick whichever one you want. Um, the longer one is what the artificial intelligence aircraft used to land. There's kind of two big tarmac areas, one tarmac area to the south and one tarmac area to the northeast. There's a couple of shelters uh, located in the middle of the field as well between the two runways. So the ranges are kind of set up to be convenient that you can fly over there, come back, uh, rearm, refuel here, take off, head back out to the range without it being so close like that red smoke where you're interfering with other traffic that's approaching or departing from the air. So that red smoke was there primarily so that I could take off quickly, drop laser-guided bombs, come back, and just to test all that stuff, the real laser-guided bomb range will be someplace else. What questions do you all have about Creech Air Force Base in this game? Okay, the real world Creech Air Force Base frequency and the frequency in the game for tower is 360.6. So, uh, Striker 1 flight, kick 360.6 and come up and check in. Four checking. checking. Three heavy dash four. Who's checking in? All right, Raven One Flight, we're on. All right, we're going to start our descent here in preparation for approach runway zero eight. Raven One Flight, take uh, space and go trail two nautical miles space. Four. I saw an AI 737 just trying to crash into this mountain about 20 times once. Yo, I'm trying yeah, to... Yeah, there's some approach problem. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to let you get in front of the tree. Nah, it's two. I'm on the ass end. Oh, oh, okay. okay sorry. sorry. Landing 
Wonderful to clear.
beef in Discord. Two, go ahead and park around there. Actually, the engine just ran out of fuel. Good timing. All right, check in when you're ready. Jack. Yep, I hear you. I'm with you. Ready? Same. I think gang's all here. Yeah. All right. So, what'd you all think? I died. I almost died. Yeah, I think for me the hardest part about it once it you know we started getting below 300 was actually just maintaining spacing more so than anything. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's. I mean, it, obviously, I I dicked it up, but that was a big part of why I dicked it up was we'd go over the mountain. You know, we'd slow down going up behind you. You would speed up going down. Then we'd catch, you know, we'd start catching up as we started going down. Because right as soon as you start going down the mountain, um, we're going slow up the mountain. You're going fast down the mountain. You get a lot of spacing. I would, like, make that spacing up. And then, like, right as we were coming up to the next mountain, I had to, like, back way off to avoid overshooting. And then now I'm going slow with the throttle back as I'm, like, trying to start going up a mountain. Yeah, so um, the obvious answer there is uh, your safety is more important than trying to maintain the form. And the reality is, and especially in these planes, which are identical, if you're following the guy, you really shouldn't have an opportunity to overshoot because the energy should all bleed off the same way or be stored in potential the same way, etc. A lot of it, I think, is just timing whenever to power up to lead that going up the ridge and anticipate that the person in front of you is going to be slowing down but you have to power up to you know make make your own um he, he's slowing down because he's pitched up higher than you climbing initially but by the time you get to where he is now you're going to be pitched up uh, as well if that makes sense yes. right yeah so that is essentially coming off the path of the guy in front of you and i wish these airplanes could have smoke but they can't for whatever reason because that smoke would would be useful to follow the trail of the guy in front of you so we could do longer spacing you mean uh just so you can see the actual path that the guy took ah, okay so uh, anyway, so this brings up a topic that, of course, we have not discussed yet because it happens much later when we're talking about two and four ship flying for air to ground. 
But when you're doing air to ground, especially in ingress like this, you're typically in trail um, because it's hard to have a spread formation or something coming over a hill, etc. But uh, when you're, I mean, so what you're used to in the air, air to air, right, is take, take a, um, I don't know, a line of breast formation, two nautical mile spacing or whatever it is. When you're doing formations near the ground, if everything is flat and level, sure, you can take a two nautical mile spacing. But especially for trail, which happens a lot in air to ground warfare, you're going to take a fix. So you're going to say uh, something up ahead, like uh, you see that lone house there with the lights on. I'm going to pass over it, and the next aircraft should pass over it 10 seconds later. So it's not so much a spacing in terms of distance, it's a spacing in terms of time. That makes a fuck of a lot more sense. Yeah, I guess the labels almost kind of hurt us in this case because you have that, oh, I'm not at exactly the right distance that I'm supposed to be. We're really, you know, time makes a lot more sense. Even uh, even if you're if you slow down or speed up, you're going to move in or out, but you can maintain that same time spacing a lot more easily, and it, it makes a lot more sense for what you know. You need time to react to what they do, basically. Right. So anyway, that comes up in thread two when we're in principle operating more than one aircraft in unison. But for right now, in principle, you're just learning how to do the basics yourself. Later on, we'll start talking about proper air to ground formations, tactical flying. Um, how do you approach a target, right? So for what we were doing, which is essentially low altitude and navig probably the formation that makes the most sense is a trail, which is why we did that. It also allows you, because you're inherently focused ahead of you, to not have to be looking side to side to find out if you're in the right position. Uh, all you had to look is look at is the guy in front of you. You don't have to worry about the guys behind you. Uh, sometimes that is not a smart thing, right? The first plane comes in and bombs stuff. Everyone recovers from the shock as a second plane comes in and bombs stuff. By the time the third plane comes in, everyone's manned the air defenses and that guy's screwed. So attacking things in trail formation is probably not a smart idea. And so anyway, uh, my point is there's a lot to talk about in terms of formation flying for air to ground, which is different than air to air because there's different considerations that you have. <clears throat> anyway, so all that's of, coming up. That sort of situation. Well, two things. Um, you would generally brief the the route package or whatever the route uh, that you're going to fly with uh, everyone. That way, everyone knows that you know when you get to a certain ridge line, you're turning this way or that way, um, and so they can anticipate where you're going to go. And then, two. Um, oh yeah. When you're when you're flying in on that, you may be coming. Would you be coming in more of a loose formation or a trail? And then as you approach the target, you're going to start forming up tighter for the strike. Yes, and so again, we'll talk about that initially as just two ships, but then four ships introduces additional complexity. So uh, and before every flight, of course, because flight planning, strike route planning is important, of course, you're going to go over all that. And for two additional reasons, as we uh, found out the hard way today, terrain masking prevents the flight lead from communicating at those key points when terrain is going to uh, be a factor between or amongst the flight. And he should be keeping track of that in the flight plan. And two is most of the time, air to ground emissions are flown with as few electronic emissions as possible because you're intentionally trying to hide the fact that you're coming. So there are, I mean, as part of the strike route planning, there are pre-planned things you can do. Hey, let's descend into this deep valley where there's hardly anyone and it's steep on both sides so no one has a listening post there or whatever we'll get into this valley the valley will give us a good 30 seconds of flight time that's when we'll do some communication via radio low probability of the enemy intercepting it uh, we'll get i don't know we'll jockey things up here here's the plan here's what i'm seeing hey what's your fuel state blah 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 okay we've communicated that in 30 seconds okay for the next two two minutes 45 seconds we shouldn't be talking unless it's an emergency because the enemy could intercept us 
weapons, right? All that kind of stuff goes into strike route planning in the real world. In this game, the adversary can't intercept and triangulate a radio transmission, um, but there are certain things that the adversary can do, like detect you with uh, radar. So strike route planning, as I mentioned, is going to be where a, a considerable amount of the work is done and work that is new and potentially alien. Um, this is just getting, today was just getting comfortable near the ground, seeing the problem areas that arise when you start operating with other aircraft, just so you can think ahead for when that happens in thread two and thread four. Other questions on what we did today? So when we were down low, um, what uh, what percentage of the time were you guys, uh, or do you think that the, uh, the lot ATC was able to uh, pick us up? I know you weren't able to stare at it the whole time. Uh, yeah, so that is a good question. When we were down at the 200-foot block, uh, unless we were out in those basins, we were And so you're going, if you're going to do uh, strike planning, you're going to get very comfortable in the 200 to 300 AG. But then when we were back out in kind of those salt flat areas uh, or the, the basins, uh, then we were able to be picked up there uh, from where the radar was. A firm. And so that is part of the reason why uh, we have airborne, inter uh, airborne early warning and control aircraft is those aircraft can stare down into those valleys, whereas ground-based radar have a difficult time doing that unless they're set up specifically to. So for the air-to-air -air guys, um, the adversary, especially the human op for adversary, is going to be down in those valleys hiding from that airborne early warning and control aircraft to do the same thing that we just did. That's kind of the disadvantage of those airplanes is they're always emitting and they have a powerful radar so you know what vet, what bearing they're on. You can get a good range on them because they're large, so they have a la large radar cross-section, which means you have a good fix on where they are in the sky, which means you can know where the terrain masking is and is. And you can bet that even reasonably decent uh, adversary aircraft will do that to hide from that airborne early warning and control aircraft and sneak up on things. Hmm. And so you can think of that just like being a sun almost and you're trying to stay in the shadows as you're flying around it. Yep, that's exactly how it works. So, you know, you could invest a bunch of money designing stealth airplanes and coatings and stuff, or you could just hide behind the... What other questions do you all have about what we did today? Um, I have one that's more of a, I guess, a technical question that I kind of noticed you said that if we're using our radar, our radar altimeters, like, that can be detected. Is that correct? Absolutely. Is that like a model of a DCS type thing or more just like an FYI for the real world? Uh, I don't know if it's modeled in DCS. It is definitely uh, something in the real What other questions do you have about what we've done today? Um, and again, this is maybe more of a real world question, but like if this was like we were in like more modern jets, is there a way for us to like transmit our position to, to an AWOCS or something, some, some way to transmit position that's not detectable or is that just not a thing? All electronic emissions are detectable. Even if they're encrypted, the fact that you're putting energy out allows for collection on that energy and triangulation. So that is a branch of intelligence called electronic intelligence. And the United States has dedicated aircraft that do that, as do our allies and our adversaries who are rich enough have dedicated aircraft to do that. Hmm. And it's really kind of basic. 
which means it's relatively cheap. So you can you can go online right now to to people who do like software defined radio stuff, and you can buy probably two to four hundred dollars worth of equipment and have a crude electronic intelligence station in your house shipped to your door in less than five days. From I mean, that's how accessible it is. But have the knowledge to be able to read and interpret the output from that's going to be a whole nother ball game. All that software is open source. So you just, get, you know, you get some kit. Uh, these guys do open source software to find radios. They say, buy these things, download my script. You know, it's on GitHub, whatever. I mode a nice little interface, set it up this way, and it'll tell you that something's emitting on 118.01 megahertz in this direction. And if you build an antenna array on your house or you partner with other people across the internet so you can sync up that a guy seven blocks down the road from you picked up the same transmission on this bearing with this GPS timestamp that you picked up, you can triangulate and say it was emitted. And that's what the FCC does if you use software-defined radios to transmit on frequencies that you're not supposed to be transmitting on or using power levels that you're not supposed to be using. They'll drive a van around, triangulate you, and send agents to knock on your door. So anyway, I mean, that's just what that is, electronic intelligence. Uh, does the game model that? I don't know, but it's tr fairly trivial for the game. To Other questions about what we've done today? Okay, so then if you go to the air to ground thread one channel, you can see kind of a sketch of the overall air to ground threads one through four. Tomorrow we're essentially doing the next three, maybe four blocks. So we'll talk about using guns, we'll talk about using rockets, and we'll talk about dropping general purpose unguided bombs. That's on the range that we saw at the very end of what we did today. Depending on how uh, well people do, we may talk about strafing and bombing maneuvers, um, and we'll talk about some uh, techniques and tactics for bombing. For example, if there's wind, it's probably a dumb idea to drop the bomb if the wind is blowing from your 3 or 9 o'clock. It's probably a better idea to drop the bomb if the wind is blowing from your back or from your nose, simply so you don't have to worry about cross-range error. And we'll also talk about terms like downrange and crossrange, so everyone 100% understands the definition of those terms. Uh, questions on what we're doing tomorrow? No, sounds exciting. Making stuff go boom. Right. So as I mentioned, most of that, uh, most of the mechanics of that is script driven. So we'll talk about how to uh, uh, to go through the F10 scripts and do all that so that you do not require me or any other human to get practice and get automated scoring. Someone asked if this stuff is written to disk. So there's a leaderboard. In principle, it is. In principle, it's enabled. I don't know for sure if it really is 100% working, but I guess we'll find out when lots of people start bombing things on this range. Our uh, question about that, are we authorized to set up our own um, events with the scripting engine once we go through that the lesson tomorrow? Or do we have to wait until we finish? Uh, you can set up whatever events you need to facilitate your training. So kind of some advanced training, even though you aren't necessarily training on how to work together, you may want to work on training on some guy dropped a bomb. Can I put another bomb on the same target in the next five seconds after his is in? Right. In principle, that's not operating together in the air, although it is operating together in terms of bomb on target. We'll also go how to. We'll also go over how to check in with the AI range controller. Uh, you'll get to see some cool scripting there and some voice acting. It isn't that cool. Um, all part of the procedure for checking in and checking out of the. And there's also some range boundaries. So when you check into the range, if you fly outside of some range boundary, it'll automatically check you out, assuming you forgot. So that's what's coming up tomorrow. What questions do you all have about what's coming up tomorrow? 
Uh, we, it, it'll tell you like, hey, you forgot to check out or something if it detects that, or will it just silently? Uh, I think the voice actor just comes up and says, uh, you know, you've you're you're ex you're outside my boundaries. I'm checking you out of the ring. Cool. Uh, in the U.S., at least, overnight tonight, we lose an hour. And early in the morning, if you're an air-to-air -air guy, we have – or, <clears throat> correction, if you're a Navy guy, we have some Case 3 recovery training early on in the morning, 8 a.m. Eastern, I think, 7 Central. So that's 5 a.m. Pacific. Any last-minute questions or comments for me? Nope, not for me. Thank you. That was good. Okay, so, I mean, we're going to go over that tomorrow, as I mentioned, Then you get lots of training. Next weekend is kind of a check session for the air-to-air -air guys. So air-to-ground guys, you'll have about two weeks before we kind of check in and do some additional training. But we'll see if the air-to-air -air guys are ready. If they're not and you guys are ready, we may do some air-to-ground stuff next week. And I'll... All right, we're done here. Um, you guys can go have dinner or whatever you're going to do, and I'll see you guys, at least the guys doing Cat three or Case 3 stuff tomorrow. Thanks, Ryan. Before you Welcome. get out of here, um, I had one other thing that's not related to the course. Okay. Uh, Bloodstained um, pinged me, um, saying he got kicked out of the program, and he was in the uh, he thought he was joined up with the cadre program because he took Spaghetti's spot um, and was trying to set up a check ride when he got kicked out. So I'm just uh, throwing that out for you. You can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> Who is he trying to set up a check ride with? Because I checked the check ride signups and didn't see anything from him. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, he just said that he was trying to get his check ride this last week, and I don't know if it was with Bolick or what, because I know Bolick is uh, dealing with real life stuff. So, right, uh, that's what he messaged me too. Is I was trying to get it set up with Bolick, and I'm like, Bolick said last Saturday or Sunday that he wasn't going to be doing this for a while. I'm like, what the hell is this about? So yeah, anyway, I, mean, I, figured, I'm not... I mean, that's kind of the danger of not following the procedure and posting and check right signups is who the hell knows what's happening if you're not doing that kind of. Thing. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I just wanted to, to keep you keyed. In. Right. I mean, so he sent his case or whatever, and it's like, OK, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But for for whatever reason, whatever the reason is. Uh, you didn't uh, you didn't do the check ride in time and you didn't even post that you were looking for someone so it's not that you didn't do the check ride in time because no one was available you didn't even let anyone know that you were looking for the check ride so for whatever reason you didn't accomplish the objective in time which means either it wasn't important enough or your life was so chaotic and disorganized that you shouldn't be spending time on this anyway which is why that three month cooling off period comes to be maybe later on it'll be more important or his life will be less chaotic or whatever it is and then he can pick up it's not a problem but it's built in there primarily to prevent all of us from wasting time on people who haven't organized their life for whatever reason yeah i'll, I'll pass that on <laughs> Right. I mean, that's not a comment. It's a commentary that he's a bad guy or whatever. It's just for whatever reason, the data, the evidence is there. It either wasn't important or your life was so chaotic and disorganized that you should focus on your life. Instead. Yeah. I mean, you've made it a lot easier for everybody uh, with having the um, check ride uh, sign up stuff. So, I mean, it's easy to tell whether someone, um, you know, aggressively seeking to move forward or just kind of riding along. Exactly. And it's all transparent, right? Like none of this is you sent me a secret message or you're communicating with Bullock or whatever. It's all out there for everyone to see. So anyway, that's the explanation there. Any other questions about anything? So then tomorrow morning we do um, the uh, type three carrier stuff uh, or case three carrier. And then after that in the afternoon doing the uh, air to ground uh, uh, 
uh, weapons employment. Uh, True. So yeah, if you're doing both, it's potentially several hours tomorrow that you're spending with DCA. Oof. I had to rename my girlfriend from Wendy's to Popeye, by the way, just so you know. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Same reason. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so I'm laughing because what you all don't know yet is um, Spaghetti and I have been working on some... Uh, phase two hot cadet level three liveries for the c101s and the goddamn navy livery has popeye on the tail damn yeah i saw that that's pretty awesome <laughs> so you're gonna love it yep that's right on brand okay I think he's going to finish that up tonight, so assuming he can get it done tonight or tomorrow, I'll have it posted and put into the mission file probably for Monday, and you'll get All right, I'm going to get out of here and get prepped to go to sleep early so I can get up super early to do this case through recovery. All right, man. Have a good one. You too. Take care. You are a brave man. <laughs> hey, I, like I said, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm not 